Uh, my name is Eric Tesco, and I'm sorry about that delay. Uh, I'm with the uh, ADSA Graduate Student Division, and I would like to uh, welcome everybody to the second installment of the uh, Pioneers of Dairy Science webinar series. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Thatcher. Uh, he's Professor Emeritus at the Department of Animal Science at University of Florida. Uh, Dr. Thatcher is going to speak to us about uh, dealing with the infertility of dairy cows in his, title talk, his talk titled Dealing with Infertility of Lactating Dairy Cows, the Foster Mothers of the Human Race, Evolving Perspectives of an Animal Science. Uh, Dr. Thatcher. Good morning, Eric and attendees. It's a real pleasure for me to... Uh, present this presentation dealing with infertility of lactating dairy cows, the foster mothers of the human race, evolving perspective of an animal scientist. <clears throat> and let me uh, start first by uh, thanking Eric. Um, I've really enjoyed working with Eric, um, Kevin, and Walter on this uh, presentation and the opportunity to speak with you. <clears throat> What I'd like to emphasize uh, right away is I'm going to be dealing with kind of a historical perspective that um, looks at the development of the uh, early follicle process of ovulation, the uh, fertilization, formation of the corpus luteum, um, actually post-fertilization development of the embryo, and then ultimately into the newborn calf. <clears throat> and I'm going to do this from a historical perspective. I want to uh, show why I think that the foster mother of the human race is really the dairy cow. <clears throat> and secondly, I want to uh, emphasize <clears throat> the collaboration that's undergone in developing this area of trying to improve infertility in the lactating dairy cow. First, let me start off uh, 8 to 10,000 years ago. This is a uh, Ali Kadrak cave in Somalia, and <clears throat> I had a chance to attend a lecture in France where uh, this was presented, this is eight to 10,000 years ago. And you can see here on the uh, slide presentation, uh, two things. Here's the cow, and it's decorated ornately uh, across the, the neck below the horns there. And then you can see probably the first graduate student that's been working in this area, uh, dressed very similarly. And then if you look at the cow, it's, a, it's not a black and white cow, it's a brown cow, and it has a very prominent udder. And so you can start, begin to see here the uh, interrelationship between uh, the dairy cow and the human race. And then what I wanted to do was to um, move on to the time of Leonardo da Vinci. <clears throat> and his presentation in a book uh, published about copulation in 1493. And Leonardo da Vinci was a very multi-talented individual. He was an uh, anatomist. Uh, a mathematician, a painter, a sculpturer, a botanist. He had an unquestionable curiosity and an inventive imagination. <clears throat> and if you look at his um, presentation here, at one, this is part of a, uh, of a figure that he had published in, a, in, his, in his writings. And you'll see the breast of a, of a woman in the teat. And you can see that he has it linked down below to the uterus, which I've marked in yellow. So he made the connection between the mammary gland and the uterus. <clears throat> and this was uh, very interesting. He didn't obviously recognize at that time uh, the importance of the brain and release of oxytocin upon stimulation and then effect on the uterus. But he's linking the mammary gland with the uterus in terms of functionality. The second point I want to make is that if you uh, look at his drawing of the placenta here on the left. You can see the vascularization um, to the placenta in, in this cross section. You can see the, uh, the placenta in the embryo. You can see the umbilical vessels, and here's this nice human fetus. And as I indicated, being an anatomist and comp comparative, he actually set a drawing, a human placenta, made an era in that he drew the placenta of a cow. You can see the cotyledonary placenta here, uh, where there is interchange that is going on. So you can see that this is a, um, a very nice link, historically, that has come about <clears throat> as early as 1492-93 with uh, the observations of Leonardo da Vinci. 
Next thing I want to do is to um, make the point that current scientists and those in training have exciting repertoires of experimental models and technological data and tools that bring to bear in improving animal productivity with the use of the whole animal and various aspects of molecular biology. It's an exciting time. But historically, don't lose sight of the past. I wanted to give an example of Joseph Holbein. Joseph Holbein was a medical doctor, and he was very active in his veterinary practice, not veterinary practice, his human practice, at approximately about 1895. And he published a paper here, you can see, in 1905, called The Inner Secretion of the Ovary and the Placenta and Its Importance in the Function of the Mammary Gland. So this is a practice in the human area. This is uh, Professor Alban in his later years. He died in 1937. That publication was in 1905. And this is a figure showing the development of the mammary gland and the uterus in the human. And it's very interesting here. We start off here in the embryonic stage, and you can see the uterus is the dark line, and the broken line is the mammary gland. The point I want to make here is that you can see they are collated in their growth and development. So you can see during uh, pregnancy, there's an increase in the embryonic mammary gland and the uterus. Notice this growth spurt that is happening right at the time of birth. Uh, it brings into practice the point right presently that lactocline secretions, perhaps in terms of colostrum, et cetera, uh, are influencing uh, the development and early carryover specs carryover effects that we have now that are um, well recognized and are being investigated. Then you can see the linear growth that's uh, occurring here up to the time of puberty and with the activation of the ovary we get a stimulation both in the uterus and the mammary gland reoccurring estrous cycles <clears throat> and with the initiation of pregnancy we have the concurrent regulation and obviously the growth of the uterus and the mammary gland. And this is all followed by uh, Professor Halbon, and diagrammed, and the choice of the mother not to nurse, and we see the regression of the uh, uterus and the mammary gland, and then reoccurring estrous cycles that are occurring fairly rapidly after the delivery of the baby and the mother is not nursing. And then he was plotting here, you can see the next pregnancy, and the decision was to nurse and you can see the mammary gland is sustained and the uterus actually regresses at a earlier, quicker, quicker rate postpartum. And then reoccurrence of uh, estrous cycles. And then we go through the period of premenopausal, menopausal, and senescence. So the issue here that I'd like to point out is that when you go back and look at his papers, he made, he was quite an experimentalist. He did a, several things. He transplanted ovaries in laboratory animals like the rabbit. And he made the observations that um, one of the issues that happens at this early period of time uh, from his observations was that oftentimes the corpus luteum is sustained for long periods of time. And the other one is that he made the observation that actually hair growth occurred during pregnancy in the, in, in the mother. And he hypothesized or pointed out that there must be factors that are being secreted by the ovary or by the placenta that seem to be influencing both the mammary gland and the, the uterus. If we now <clears throat> go on to the time of about 1932, Willard Allen, who was able to um, work in the area of organic chemistry as an undergraduate a major, and he was working in the laboratory of um, George Comer at the University of Rochester, and he actually um, purified, isolated, the hormone progesterone, and published a paper in 1932-1933 in terms of the isolation of uh, the progesterone, the molecule that undoubtedly is involved in the observations made by Holbein, etc. If we move on now, I want to use uh, an early example of progesterone in the animal sciences area, and I point to this slide here with Lester Cassida, <clears throat> the University of Wisconsin. And you're going to see here a long line of investigators in families associated, scientific families and their students and their grandchildren 
that uh, have contributed to the animal science areas in terms of trying to improve the area of fertility. His student was Lester Alberg, who was a professor at North Carolina State University when I went first to went to the University of, uh, of Florida. And uh, Dr. Uh, Alberg was giving progesterone injections from 15 to 18 days of the estrus cycle. And you look at his zero dose here with 43 cycles. He looked and measured the size of the follicle uh, at day 28. And you can see it's about 14 millimeters in size. When he went ahead and gave additional doses of progesterone, in the blue here you can see a three and a six milligram dose <clears throat> between 15 to 28 days. You can see when he stopped at 28 days, he had animals that had already been in heat five to minus three days before the day 28, which would put them back approximately about day 21 of a cycle. So the progesterone did not inhibit the cycle. And uh, we now know that un undoubtedly this was the first wave of cycle two that he was looking at at 28 days. In other words, the animals were in the heat five or seven days earlier, and they're growing a follicle, and the follicle is about 14 millimeters. With a higher dose, you can see now your follicles are larger, and they're going down in size with the increase in dose. And you can see these animals now are coming into heat two to six days after the last progesterone injection. And so this would be what we call the second wave of cycle one. In other words, uh, there's, this, there's two follicle waves that I'll show you in the uh, first during the, during the cycle. This is the, the second wave, and that follicle is being uh, sustained and continues to grow here up to 24 millimeters. And the animals come into heat two to three days after the withdrawal of the uh, progesterone dose at day 28. So he synchronized basically follicle development here. So this is a very important observation relative to the potential use of progesterone. I'd like to move on now to Dr. Alberg when he was a um, faculty member and one of his students, Jack Britt. Uh, in about 1969, I first saw this data as a young assistant professor at a local meeting of the Southern ADSA section. The paper was published in 1972, and he was using a synthetic progestin. And the concept that Dr. Britt, Dr. Alberg were working on was trying to group cows by um, bolusing these animals with uh, a, a synthetic progesterone called MGA. And there's three groups here, and the two treatment groups are feeding MGA for 14 days in one group, then withdrawing the EMGA. And then the second group, uh, giving MGA for the same 14 days, withdrawing it. You can see in both groups, the animals are coming into estrus here in the first bars. And then in the second group, approximately 11 days after the withdrawal of MGA and breeding to these heats, he resynchronized or retreated animals for a second treatment of MGA. Now, what was the observations that were that were made here when he starts at 11 days? He has a group of heats that were synchronized after the first treatment of MGA, and a group of heats that were occurring uh, after the second treatment of MGA. When you look at the results, the conception rate to the synchronized heats with MGA was approximately 14% compared to 38% in a control group that did not receive MGA. So fertility was suppressed. Now you can see when he lets the animals come back into heat spontaneously after synchronizing them here, he has a 51% conception rate, which is much higher than the 14%. So this was the synchronized fertile estrus. And the fertility to these animals here would have been, would have been lower, was lower. Now. Uh, the insertion of the MGA here is in animals that are both pregnant and non-pregnant, and those animals that are non-pregnant would have been resynchronized. The concept that they were trying to do here, which I think is relevant to what we're trying to do today, is to group animals in groups. For example, when they started here, they were <clears throat> approximately um, 56 days postpartum. They entered animals in a cluster back at the time of parturition in, in th three-week 
calved in a three-week period. And these animals would have been 35 to 58 days when they started their MGA. And they come into heat, and then three weeks later, they would start another cluster of animals. So they would have groups of animals uh, coming into heat over a seven-day period every three weeks, and they would overlap. Uh, for example, animals that were started in the second cluster period two would be having their first synchronization here when these animals were coming into heat up here. So he was grouping the animals, and that's an important uh, concept. And this is one of the first studies that really made an attempt to, to do that. The issue here, though, is that we have low fertility following the treatment with the MGA, and many reported rather large follicles on the ovary um, that contributed to that ovulation. The system for controlling estrus in groups of cows could be beneficial as part of a total system to manage for high reproductive rate in large herds. So what we have here is a cross-section of the ovaries, and uh, there's two points here. You can see there's a large follicle on this right ovary, and here you can see when, it's, when the cross-section is on the left ovary, you can see a large corpus luteum and a smaller, uh, smaller follicle. So the, I think the issue here is uh, what can be done to regress the corpus luteum without feeding MGA or a progestin for a long period of time. And that brings us to the next major advancement, and that is the regression of the corpus luteum induced by prostaglandin F2 alpha in cattle. And a major leader was Dr. Jim Lauderdale, uh, working at the time for the uh, Upjohn company, in which uh, the group at Upjohn had uh, had the hypothesis that prostaglandin F2 alpha would be luteolytic, and that was demonstrated in cattle. And uh, Dr. Lauderdale led a, uh, a team, and incidentally, Dr. Lauderdale is also another student of Dr. Cassida. Here's an example of what prostaglandin does when you inject it into a cow with a corpus luteum on the ovary. You can see here we have high progesterone levels, and the progesterone, prostaglandin is injected, and there's a precipitous decline in progesterone. And you'll notice here right away there is a rise in estradiol. So we have a high estradiol and a low progesterone, and we get an increase here in LH basal levels and pulsatility. And this leads, because of the high estrogen and the low progesterone, a massive surge of LH that will cause ovulation. So this is showing you that removal of the CL um, causes a regression and a sequence of transitory events that are well synchronized, leading to a uh, fertile ovulation. And this was tested by Dr. Lauderdale and a group experiment uh, across the United States from several different regions. And basically, uh, there's three groups here. Uh, all these cattle had corpus lutea. These were dairy heifers. And so they all had a, uh, a corpus luteum when they entered the experiment. And the control group was uh, Heat detected anywhere from 8 to 25 days um, at, the, at the beginning or the onset of the experiment, and they got a 53.3% conception rate. The two treatment groups, one was a AI to estrus within seven days after prostaglandin. So these would have been synchronized heats. And you see he has a 52% conception rate. And then they did a timed insemination, and two times were given, so they got two inseminations, one in 72 and one in 90 hours after prostaglandin. So you can see over here on the right the distribution of heats, and you can see the times that were selected for the time AI. So this is not a single time insemination, it was two in injections. And this is the pregnancy rate across the three groups. So all the animals that were uh, eligible, that were entered into the experiment, that which, what was their pregnancy rate? For example, 65 out of the uh, we're pregnant out of the total 153 animals. So the variability of heats here, you can see, are anywhere from one day after prostaglandin out to as late as six days. And so you can see that uh, a one injection would have been a disaster, one insemination would have probably been a disaster. Two inseminations were necessary to um, result in a, a uh, pregnancy rate that was obtained here with 40%. 40, 40%. 
So I want to just make another point now. Uh, another technique or tool that is made available is the use of ultrasonography. And this was a major breakthrough. Once again, this was an extension of observations that were used in the area of human reproductive biology where ultrasound was measured by, was used to measure biological changes during the estrus, estrus cycle. Here you can see a ultrasonography uh, <clears throat> that was um, shown for the distribution of a, of a corpus luteum and follicles. And we see that um, with the advancements that have been made in ultrasound technology, here's a uh, ultrasound of a cow with a large follicle on the ovary and then a subordinate follicle of a, a smaller size. And over here you can see a cross-section of an ovary with uh, two corpa, corpa lutea. So this allowed uh, for the characterization of follicle developments and CL, et cetera, during the estrus cycle. And this is depicted in this slide here where you can see a, um, a LH surge very early when the animals uh, come into estrus, and I described that following a prostaglandin injection. And that large LH surge also has kind of a sequence of two little surges of FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, which initiates uh, growth of a pool of follicles that we can measure with ultrasound. And one of them becomes the dominant uh, follicle on the ovary and suppresses the subordinate follicles. And uh, there may be a slight rise in estradiol, but progesterone is undergoing a transition here. It's going from low levels to high levels. And in the presence of the, of the corpus luteum, the uh, first wave follicle does not continue to grow and it loses what we call its dominance. And consequently, there's a um, single rise here of follicle stimulating hormone, which um, induces a second wave follicle to develop. And you can see this follicle is developing here as the second wave is coming up, and we're getting now uh, a development of a, of a second wave follicle. Except this time, when the follicle gets to uh, the area up here where the progesterone levels are dropping, we get a um, continued growth, and the follicle goes ahead and ovulates. So the dynamics of this is really quite critical. We have progesterone priming for a period of time. Uh, there comes the down regulation of a progesterone receptor, and we start to get pulses of prostaglandin F2-alpha that regress the CL and allows this follicle to undergo development. And with the high estrogen and the low progesterone levels, the LH pulses, of cetric, go into a large surge at ovulation. So two important points here. Um, GnRH causes a LH surge, and it also causes the release of follicle-stimulating hormone. And we have here uh, corpus luteum that can be regulated by prostaglandin F2-alpha. We could have injected progesterone prostaglandin back here, regressed to CO, and had this first-wave follicle undergo a ovulation. So the effect of prostaglandin on follicle dynamics I wanted to demonstrate. Uh, this is a study that was published by John Kasselik and uh, Dr. Ali Ginther. And what we have here are cows that have a first wave and a second wave, and we're about day eight after the prior uh, ovulation here. So we have a first wave uh, fo follicle that is, is, is undergoing uh, development. And here you see at day eight, a prostaglandin injection occurred. And the majority of animals ovulated went ahead, this follicle went ahead and, and after the progesterone, prostaglandin injection, and it went ahead and ovulated. Here you can see in this three animals, the first follicle wave did not go a, acute ovulation, uh, but a second wave follicle when the progesterone levels dropped, uh, one, one went up and became the ovulatory follicle. So we have these follicles ovulating at different times when they were injected on the same day, depending upon the functional status of the first wave follicle. <clears throat> and so this is probably contributing to the variability that you see here in when cows come into heat as to whether they were exposed at the time of prostaglandin injection to a first wave follicle, a second wave follicle, or the stage of the follicle uh, of the first wave, for example, uh, when the prostaglandin was, was given. So this led then to um, the concept that 
gonadotropin releasing hormone can be injected. And here's a demonstration. You give GnRH and you get a, <clears throat> a nice surge of luteinizing hormone. Not shown on this slide would be a concurrent surge in follicle stimulating hormone. And this has been used quite a bit in the postpartum uh, dairy cows. And um, Jock McMillan from New Zealand um, worked with us on trying to see if we could control follicle development with that. And I just put up one slide here that demonstrates the concept. Um, <clears throat> this is animals at day seven of the estrus cycle, and they were given a synthetic progestin implant, an ergestimet implant, to maintain a low level of um, progesterone. Prostaglandin was given, and so you can see this is uh, the first corpus luteum at day seven of the cycle, and the size of the corpus, corpus luteum declines, and the progesterone levels in black here declined. So that was the effect of the prostaglandin F2, F2 alpha. You can see about two days later, after we gave the prostaglandin, um, we have on the on the ovary, uh, uh, on the, in the blood, a, a rise in estradiol, okay? And then we also have this follicle. And we give the gonadotropin releasing hormone. You can see estrogen goes down right away. The LH has luteinized that follicle, and estrogen goes down uh, immediately. And the GnRH ovulates that first wave follicle. Now, when that follicle ovulates, it forms a subsequent corpus luteum. But even more important, if you look at the dominant follicle here, you can see that when this follicle um, ovulated, we were recruiting a new follicle on the ovary. And this is the point. GnRH is inducing the recruitment of a new follicle wave. And here we pull the progestin, give the prostaglandin, and when we do that, this follicle goes ahead and ovulates. So what we've done here is we've used um, some natural concepts, exposure to progesterone, prostaglandin that is normally secreted by the uterus, GnRH, to synchronize both follicle development and corpus luteum regression. So this was put together. Uh, Dr. Malo Wiltbank and his student Richard Persley at the time, uh, working with lactating dairy cows, um, developed what we call the OVSYNC program. This is a stylized uh, cartoon here that really shows the sequence. This is about day five or nine of the cycle, uh, idealized here. Uh, GnRH is given. This causes ovulation of that first wave follicle. We're in a high progesterone environment because the CL had developed from the previous ovulation. The uh, LH causes the follicle to ovulate. Here we have an increase in FSH that recruits a new follicle on the ovary. Um, they worked out a situation at seven-day interval and gave prostaglandin F2 alpha. That regresses the CL. This follicle goes on ahead. And then timing of the GnRH causes the follicle to, uh, to ovulate. <clears throat> and we have here opportunity to do a time insemination and development of a new CL, post-fertilization, and hopefully initiate a, a pregnancy. So this was a scheme that basically synchronizes the normal physiological transitional changes in hormones to mimic what would happen in the, in the normal situation resulting in fertility. I don't want to spend too much time in this, but I want to just show you, the, if you look at um, progesterone or, or, or progestins in this particular experiment, which is progesterone, and you look at the injection of PGF2 alpha, you have a high level of progesterone, and you can see it goes down very nicely here with time, 1.8, 0.7, 0.6, 0.5. And consequently, as well, you have estradiol levels going up to nice levels that you would see in a lactating uh, dairy cow. And here you can see an increase in basal levels of LH. This is very, uh, very important and very physiological. Now, the point that I want to make here is in this slide. This is not as complicated as it looks. Um, this is the injections of gonadotropin releasing hormone at zero time after prostaglandin, 12, 24, 48, or 68, 60 hours. So if we just look at progesterone levels at the time progesterone prostaglandin is given, you can see the progesterone levels are high when, it, when you give it at zero hours. And then you see a drop down to two nanograms 12 hours after the injection of um, prostaglandin. And then down to uh, 24 hours here, you can see you still have a drop in progesterone. But note, even though the progesterone levels are dropping, there's still luteal tissue on the ovary 
where there's an increase in progesterone. It's not until you get out here to 60 hours when progesterone levels are low and you get no subsequent increase. This is quite important. And you can see here uh, reduced LH response when you give GnRH at zero hours, an increase when you get to 12 hours, a further increase when you get to 24 hours. But remember, even at 24 hours, you're still getting a rise in progesterone after you give the GnRH. It's not until 60 hours here do we really get good release of LH and no residual levels of progesterone. So this becomes very important in looking at the dynamics of time dissemination. Principles of OBSYNC time to AI programs are kind of summarized in this slide. Uh, GnRH, prostaglandin, and intravaginal inserts containing progesterone are the only reproductive hormones labeled for use in dairy cattle in the United States. Um, very interesting work that had been done uh, as far back as uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Wilpank, uh, Milo Wilpank's dad, on the use of estrogens for what they were thinking at the time was the regression of the CL, but the uh, work has been shown you know, by his son and others that uh, estrogen is actually uh, having astritic effects on the follicle. And that was used for synchronization programs and still is in other countries. Pivotal points to high fertility based on these programs is initiate the program during early diestrus. The first injection of GnRH ovulates a dominant follicle, thereby causing synchronization of ovulation and controls follicle dominance. The prostaglandin completely regresses the CL. We now know we want to have progesterone levels down to about 0.3 to 0.2 nanograms per mil to get optimal pregnancy rates. And the second GnRH causes a synchronous ovulation within 24 to 36 hours of injection. Now, in the OPSYNC protocol, it's, it's important to be in the early stages of diestrus, about five days or so. So this led to the concept of setting the animals up in what we call pre-sync programs. And this is a very, very good manuscript here, a review of this area of timed AI by Persley and Wilthank. And they're pointing out the point here that there's three, three different systems that have been developed. Initially, the pre-sync program and 11-day interval. So this is four injection, two injections across the gland, 14 days apart. And 11 days later, give GnRH and prostaglandin seven days, 56 hours later, GnRH, and 16 hours AI. And then uh, Richard Persley has developed the uh, G6G, which is a prostaglandin injection, wait two days, <clears throat> give GnRH, six days later, start the off-sync protocol. Notice here, 56 hours is close to the 60 hours where you give uh, GN GN GnRH, and uh, there is no subsequent increase in progesterone, but very nice release of LH. And then this is the double off-sync program, and as the name suggests, the animals are getting set up here for the final off-sync by going through a, a, pr a primary off-sync to synchronize the animals. GnRH, prostaglandin seven days later, three days later, GnRH, and then seven days later, starting the off-sync. So this would get the animals so they would be in the early diestrous phase, uh, and animals that probably are and ovulatory could be stimulated very nicely to um, begin to uh, cycle and begin to take advantage of getting them pregnant. So I want to just make a couple points here. Um, these are, were really important and, and relevant to the industry. Um, the the pre-sync program, 14 days apart, uh, has been used by dairy producers for by waiting 14 days to start the the GnRH of the OBSYNC protocol. Um, the original trials that were done by Marrera showed a 12-day interval was used, and this is a study that was looking at 11-day intervals, so 14-day versus 11-day. 14-day is convenient for the farmer. 11-day is probably optimal for the physiological response of the cow. And you can see that here. Um, first thing is, if you look at the 14-day interval and the 11-day interval, you can see cyclic cows, 37% uh, <clears throat> of them ovulate to the first GnRH injection versus 11-day interval, a higher rate of ovulation and improvement of a new follicle, 54%. And here's the pregnancy rate, 33, and it went up to 40.5. So changing the dynamics here was really quite important for fertility. 
And then the double OBSYNC program compares the, um, this is Dr. Wilbank's laboratory, um, develop, b b developing, and this was a, their second study with a large number of animals, looking at double OBSYNC versus a pre-SYNC OBSYNC. So here's the 14-day interval. They went to a 12-day interval, which is good. And then they go in here with a OBSYNC here of um, seven days, 56 hours, and 12 to 14 hours. The double op sync is, as I described previously, seven days, wait three days, give GNRH, seven days later, start the op sync. So these are two strategies to be able to get a optimal pregnancy rate following the final op sync. And here you can see the results that um, the laboratory has detected. These are primiparous animals, and you can see they had a 52.9% pregnancy rate versus a 47.5 when they compared it to the pre-sync off-sync. So the, so the uh, double off-sync in primiparous animals in this study showed an advantage. One might speculate that um, there's probably maybe some greater number of primiparous animals that are on the anovatory stage, and uh, they are benefit by a double, double off-sync. And here, with the multiparous animals, uh, tendency to have a difference, but much less than what you see over here with the primiparous animals. What I want to show you here is another strategy to try to optimize the follicle development. Uh, Dr. Jose Santos in his laboratory at the University of uh, Florida were looking at a concept here of being able to change the, the time of dominance, going from a GNRH to a prostaglandin injection of seven days, which would be about a a seven and a half day period of follicle dominance, going down to an interval of five days. GNRH to prostaglandin seven, GNRH to prostaglandin five days. And this dominance period is 5.5 uh, five days. And if you look at the results here, they go from 33%, 34% to 39%, a significant difference here, an improvement simply by changing the timing of the injections. Now, by doing this, you, know, you also need to be able to give two injections of prostaglandin F2 alpha. Uh, five day interval, there's going to be new corpora lutea that formed here that are going to be right on the borderline. And the second prostaglandin injection, and in this study was done one day later to ensure complete CL regression. But this system results in an increase in pregnancy rate. And then um, one of Dr. Santos' students, Eduardo Riverio, looked at the method of presynchronization in a large number of animals, 1,700 animals. And this is in a pasture-based program that was done. And he's comparing uh, pre-sync with a double off-sync, 14 days versus seven days. And you can see the uh, protocol here is they start the off-sync, and he's starting this 10 days after the second injection of prostaglandin. And then here we have the double off-sync, GNRH prostaglandin, three days. We went to a six-day interval. And then we used, in both groups, a five-day interval instead of a seven-day interval between GNRH and prostaglandin. Results here uh, are very interesting. Um, the pre-sync, off-sync, first service, 59.1, 56.8. There's not a significant difference. This is a pasture-based program, very high fertility. You'll notice now in these trials, uh, different trials here under intensive conditions or under um, pasture-based conditions, we're getting really good pregnancy rates. And here at 65 days, 51.7, 52.2, we've gone from 59.1 down to 51.7. There is a significantly higher um, lower embryonic loss here, and we end up here with the same um, pregnancy rate, 51.7 versus 52.2. So here, a free sync, off sync, double off sync works. Uh, I put up here uh, the diagram of those two protocols. I won't go through them again. I think you have those in your in your um, in your mind now, imprinted. And uh, and so I think this pre-sync five-day co-sync program is very effective, and the double off sync are very effective. Question: What, is, what do we do now with cows that didn't conceive to the first service? And that results in uh, resynchronization and Here's a study that was done um, by the Wilt Bank Laboratory, and which that 32 days after the first insemination, 
they just do another off sync and they compare that starting at 22 days with a uh, pre resync that is, the double off sync is, is followed and looking at the pregnancy rates. So, animals that are open, they got 27.0% at the second breeding versus 35.3. So, this is an um, improvement and a, a very acceptable pregnancy rate that you see by using a double, double off sync for the resynchronization of animals that are um, not, not pregnant. This raises the issue then how to use progesterone. The hormone used, isolated by Willard Allen, used by Les Allberg at different times, and how to use progesterone. And one place to use progesterone is in the resynchronization process. And uh, Raphael Bosnito shows you right here that uh, pregnancy diagnosis done at 32 days to the first service. Uh, two days later, they just start an off sync. It's a five day program, and they're comparing um, a straight program versus one that also has a cedar device added. So, this is really a, uh, a co sync program here um, in animals that are diagnosed open with or without progesterone. And they're getting uh, basically their, their um, pregnancy response here. And you can see very high pregnancy rates to the second service. And the CEDAR device actually caused a stimulation in pregnancy rate. So this is another strategy that's been developed to deal with these infertile cows. Now, are all cows under practical conditions ideal for time to eye? Well, this just shows you um, what you get in the field. This is field data that was summarized. <clears throat> and you can see that um, cows that are starting an off sync in their second follicle wave, get higher pregnancy rates than cows that are anobler, that they have, they have no CL, or they're cycling, but they are in the early stage of the first wave cycle with um, very low progesterone levels. They have lower fertility levels. 31 days, 66 days, you can see they have lower levels of, of pregnancy. And this is an experiment that was done by um, Dr. Santos's laboratory where basically <clears throat> it, they took animals that had no CLs when they started the um, off-sync program and they're doing a five-day program here, GNRH, prostaglandin, two injections, GNRH AI, <clears throat> and th that's their control. And then here's two seeder devices. Notice that two seeder devices, these are lactating dairy cows, they had to put two cedar devices in to get their progesterone levels sufficiently high. So we're comparing no corpus lutea at the time, the beginning of the program, and with and with and without progesterone. And then these are a positive control. These are animals that have a corpus luteum that go through the same protocol as ones that don't have a corpus luteum. And the results here are quite striking. You can see animals without a CL have uh, lower levels of progesterone. Animals that are in diestrus have high levels of progesterone. The ones without a CL that got two seeders have increased levels of progesterone. And look at the results <clears throat> that you uh, obtain between these groups. You can see that the addition of two seeders for diestrous animals had higher levels of progesterone or higher levels of pregnancy than did the animals that were the control, either 34 or 62 days and low levels of pregnancy losses. So the take home message here, cows that ovulate first wave follicles have reduced fertility compared with cows that ovulate second wave follicles. The decrease in fertility is associated with low concentrations of progesterone during follicular growth. And I wanna just make a point that dairy heifers can now be time inseminated with good acceptable pregnancy rates. And this is probably the, uh, Program of choice is a five-day program. In fact, this was necessary and was developed in heifers initially um, and then was adapted to the lactating dairy cow. And you can see here, five-day program, they get a cedar device, two injections across the glandin, and GNRH and AI, this is a co-sync. They're disseminated at the same time they get the GNRH. And when you do that, you can see we're getting 62% 
in this particular study, pregnancy rates at day 32. And there's a real use for this, particularly with dairy heifers to tighten up the age, their age in terms of when they get pregnant and potential use for sex semen. So let me just make a, a couple points here in wrapping this up. Large herds with high production and excellent reproduction. I'm here just during this um, seminar here in California, and I had the opportunity to um, visit the Jack De, De Jong, uh herd at the River Ranch Dairy. And I just want to point out to you that uh, <clears throat> there's, they have 5,400 lactating dairy cows. Their mean milk production is 43 kilograms per cow. 13,200 kilograms of fat corrected milk per cow, uh, annual mean pregnancy rate of 38%, and they're using this te technology, and a 21-day annual pregnancy rate of 27%. A point here is that uh, high-producing dairy cows are healthy, they produce a lot of milk, um, <clears throat> and they're fertile. They just need to be managed in a way that they're entitled to. This is a pristine uh, operation. This is the kind of a farm that we should be taking our consumers to see in terms of how cows are managed. They're not out here on a lush pasture grass here in California. They're in a plush environment, <clears throat> um, plenty of space. Each cow has their own potential stall to, to, to eat in. They're um, managed optimally in terms of nutrition management. Uh, they go into a rotary milk and parlor. Uh, it's like a sewing circle. They can communicate with each other. Um, cows are comfortable. Uh, they're managed very well in the periparturian period. And uh, my experience when taking uh, non-animal people to dairy farms is amazing when they see these type of operations and how content the cows are. This is what we should be showing the public. Having said that, there's still more to be done in terms of trying to optimize reproductive performance. Uh, <clears throat> there needs to be a holistic approach. I'm just trying to point out here some um, summary data. Looking at body condition score change from calving to 65 days in milk and milk yield. And uh, in this review that was um, done, you can see if you look at the cyclic response, as cows lose more body condition, you can see the, uh, the if, if they lose more body condition, the incidence of an estrus or cyclic activity is reduced, 758.7. And if there's no change in body condition or loss of one unit, <clears throat> you see it's 74.6%. Uh, milk yield broken down into quartiles, really no difference in cyclicity activity. This is pregnancy rate. You can see the drop in body condition scores associated with a decrease in pregnancy rate. So it's not necessarily the milk yield that's the issue here. It's we, how we manage these cows in the transitional period and optimize their nutrient management. Monitoring postpartum health is part of the equation here. Some of the indicators that are used to look at the attitude of the animal, animals, uh, inspect those animals in terms of their postpartum uh, secretions, take the uh, recording, recording temperature, identifying animals that are uh, that are sick, and checking for ketosis. These are integrated postpartum health programs that are really critical. And how do we uh, optimize the performance of these animals through uh, health criteria as well as through how we deal with these animals in terms of their nutrient management? It's a very important area in dealing with the immunosuppression. Uh, here's an example. You can see in this uh, <clears throat> study that was um, summarized, you can see first 60 days in milk and pregnancy in dairy cows. If the cows were healthy, they had a 51.4% pregnancy rate. If they had uh, one case of a disease, 43.3%, or if they had greater than one case of disease, their subsequent fertility is 34.7. And you can see... If you look at the type of the health problem, there's a cluster here inside the red that are inter-associated events. And all of these are reducing uh, fertility. Ketosis, mastitis, fever postpartum, uh, clini metritis, clinical endometritis, puberal metritis, 
um, cabin problems, dystocia, et cetera, all contribute to a decrease in pregnancy rate. So <clears throat> these are areas that uh, we can be focusing, be working on that is really uh, quite important. And I'm gonna end here on just showing you the trends, genetic trends in daughter pregnancy rate and milk yield. You can see as milk yield's going up here on 75 to milk based upon the Animal Improvement Program Laboratory, daughter pregnancy rate is going down. And with the measurement of productive life, daughter pregnancy rates in terms of adding that to their selection criteria, this is starting to be uh, reversed. And a lot of new technology here is gonna be very uh, critical. If we look at the phenotypic trends, you can see here that daughter pregnancy rate is going down as milk yields went up. But you see we made a turn here. And we're back up to about the levels of about 1980. And um, this is due to changes in management, how to manage these lactating dairy cows. Some of the technology that I've shown you <coughs> um, is contributing, uh, con contributing to that. So these are exciting times. Um, I think advancements are going to be further focused on a holistic approaches, the excitement about the use of sex semen, nutraceuticals in terms of regulating the paraparturian period, uh, use, strategic use of bovine somatotropin, uh, programming the newborn calf so that she actually develops physiologically uh, in an optimal manner. So I'm going to stop here at this point. I think we're on time in terms of how long the presentation has gone for. I'm Apologize for being uh, a little late. We had some technical difficulties that were due to me. But thank you, Eric, and I'll, I'll stop here and be glad to try to uh, answer any questions. All right. Uh, thank you for that wonderful talk, Dr. Thatcher. Um, and at this point, I can uh, we can open up the floor, or I guess the virtual floor, to. Any questions? Uh, again, if you push the uh, Q and A button at the top of your screen here, uh, you can just type your questions, and we'll get to them. And I guess I can uh, lead off with a, a question, kind of unrelated, but um, of interest uh, to me, and I think maybe to the future of uh, dairy cows. Uh, what what has been done? I guess looking at how maternal nutrition um, or perhaps early calf nutrition, um, and those may be two separate questions, how does that affect the uh, following generation's fertility? So like any uh, fetal programming or epigenetic effects that take place during the uh, uh, gestation, how does, how does that affect the um, conception rates and uh, fertility of the next generation of, of uh, cow? Yes. Yes, Eric, that's a very, very good question. Um, it's an exciting question, actually. <clears throat> There's um, more and more evidence brought to bear now in several different species that, uh, for example, the, the lactocrine secretions, the secretions that are in colostrum that um, the, the, the newborn calf consumes right after birth contains a plethora of, of growth factors. And uh, this undoubtedly is probably having some bearing on the immune response of the animal, of course, but also its differentiation and development in terms of uterine gland development, for example, in pigs like the species, as Frank Bartol has demonstrated that at Auburn, uh, at, at Auburn University. Um, the importance of the uh, interaction between the conceptus and the, the mother uh, has been demonstrated many times in terms of uh, cows, Jersey cows that are selected for milk yield versus control cows have a different hormonal profile in the prepartum period. Cows that are heat stressed have a different profile in the prepartum uh, uh, period compared to control animals. And uh, the third thing is just the genotypes that the cow heifers are bred to uh, have more difference, differences in the uh, paraparturian hormonal changes. And we tend to focus uh, on the maternal responses as to how they do postpartum, but we really haven't looked at the uh, effect on the calf. And I think, I think the uh, nutritional modulation, the type of polyunsaturated fatty acids that are being fed, or, 
whether the animals are having a um, uh, uh, over condition or a, uh, being fed diets where the, um, they're actually gaining uh, too much body condition in the in the dry period um, leads to greater disruption uh, in the postpartum periods. Some of the work in Illinois pointing out what might be the optimal protein to fat ratio in the milk in the in the in the early postpartum period to uh, transition better, animals better. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the nutritional paraparturian uh, nutrition of the maternal unit. And we, we have some evidence, uh, Dr. Staples and Santos, one of their students, um, um, Miriam Garcia, has been looking at the amount of linoleic acid that the uh, calves are exposed to in utero to the maternal diet, and then also the type of milk replacer. And they have some evidence that the amount of milk produced by those cows, <coughs> heifers, calves in their first lactation is different depending upon whether the mother was on a um, fat type of diet versus a non-fat diet in the prepartum period. So these are exciting uh, aspects. Um, we really need to be looking at the reproductive performance of these, of, the, of these animals, and it's a great experimental model to work with. There's a recent publication by uh, Dr. Bradford at your inst institution and their group showing that the sex of the fetus, uh, if a cow is carrying a female fetus, she's giving um, more milk than if she's carrying a male fetus after she delivers that uh, fetus. So this is pretty exciting and it can, something needs to be followed up on uh, experimentally and look at the mechanism. So uh, the aspects of being able to manipulate the, the nutrition or the um, programming of the conceptus during uh, its pregnancy and its carryover effect in the postpartum period is a, is a, a very important important area. All right, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Lauren Mayo, uh, University of Kentucky. And, okay. Uh, Dr. Thatcher, what are your thoughts on using accelerometers and other precision dairy farming techniques in conjunction with synchronization protocols to insist or to assist in increasing pregnancy rates or even monitoring cattle cycles on a more individual basis? Well, I, I think that's that's a, a management option that is very good. Um, I'll tell you, if you're in a dairy farm that's got 70% or greater, and I'm just giving you my opinion on this, uh, heat detection capabilities, um, you have to really question whether Time AI can serve a role there. But if you look at these Time AI programs, uh, like some of the pre-sync aspects, um, there's a chance to breed animals before they get to the off-sync component. So estrus detection there could, could be very important. Uh, I, I think that uh, there's two points that I want to make. Um, the technology with accelerometers, et cetera, to be able to detect heat is, 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 is good. You're going to detect cows uh, in heat. We can debate how, how efficient they are and uh, this type of thing. But they're going to be very productive, and they can be combined with these programs. Um, these Time AI programs now are actually developing into what I would consider to be fertility programs. We can uh, treat way animals in, a, in, in very specific ways with flexibility in terms of management, making a decision on an individual basis as to how we treat the animals in, in, a, in a Time AI type of a program that um, results in an increase in fertility. And so um, I'm not convinced that you're going to get that with just a, 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 sole, a, a sole estrus detection system. But in terms of using these accelerometers, yes, they have a, uh, they have a role. Uh, you know, you have to uh, uh, integrate that into your dairy management system that you have at the, at the farm. But for sure, that's uh, a very important use of technology that's even going to further improve with the future. All right, uh, well, we have another question here. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Uh, do you think we could group, cow, group the cows based on their milk production to either do a timed AI program or combine uh, programs with heat detection? Well, I think that that's a possibility. Physiologically, um, cows that are producing high amounts of milk 
are going to have a greater metabolism of uh, steroid steroid hormones, and I think this contributes to um, some contributes to the challenge of being able to detect those animals into in estrus. Um, I think I demonstrated at least on terms of what you can get on a large commercial dairy farm. Um, very good in uh, pregnancy, pregnancy rates and lactating dairy cows. So the, the aspect of grouping them, um, basically to some extent they're grouped for that first service just because of cho choice of the voluntary um, waiting period. Now, um, whether you should treat primiparous animals different than multiparous animals or group them to be able to um, manage them is a it, it, it is an issue or a, a question. Uh, some people actually give the heifer, the first calf heifer, a little more time to be able to become um, cyclic, based upon the challenges of uh, growing as well as producing milk for the first time and and being a spunky heifer. Um, so that's a decision that has to be made in concert with your management system, your veterinarian, your your management uh, crew and the and the competence to be able to get good compliance with these uh, with these type of programs. Uh, the question is whether a high producing all high producing cows should go into time AI versus um, lower producing cows. Not uh, it's depends on how you group your animals. Um, I think the time AI, particularly in terms of some of the fertility aspects, um, would be very useful to use in these high producing cows. Okay. All right. Um, uh, if we don't have any other questions, and I'm not seeing any here, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you again, Dr. Thatcher, for taking uh, time to give this talk. And uh, it was very, very interesting.